And I am delighted to be here at uh, Deutsche Welle's Global Media Forum this year. I work a lot with Deutsche Welle. Uh, as you probably can tell from my accent, I'm an American. So I spend a lot of time Trump-splaining on Deutsche Welle when, when something happens. Uh, but today I get to focus not so much on the headlines, but more on the trend lines, which is where I like to focus. And that's on uh, digitization and artificial intelligence. Um, I know that the topic of this year's conference is actually global inequalities, and I thought maybe we could wrap this in a little bit into our talk um, with a nice quote that I think is really, is really appropriate here uh, from William Gibson, who is a, a science fiction writer. He, said, he says, the future is already here, it's just unevenly distributed. And I think that that's definitely the case, especially when it comes to talking about artificial intelligence. Now we all have an idea of what artificial intelligence is. Uh, many of us think it's robots. Robots is in the title of, the, of this panel, of this discussion. Um, but it's actually an ecosystem of technologies. It's a way, it's a process. It's a way of processing data. Um, and you know, when we think about that robot idea, sometimes when we hear people like Vladimir Putin say, the person who controls, or the country that, the power that controls AI will control the future, we think about killer robots or we think about terminators. We don't really think about the information space. We don't think about journalism. We don't think about truth. We don't think about how facts are shaped. And maybe that's where we should go. Um, and I think that that's where we want to focus our conversation today. Um, and I am delighted to be here with a real expert, uh, Father Eric Salabe. Uh, Father Salabe is from the Order of Preachers, uh, from the Dominican Order also known as the Dominican Order, and is the founder of the Optic Network, which promotes res uh, research and innovation in the digital humanities. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about what AI means for journalism, what AI means for shaping information ecosystems, and what kind of first principles we need to consider right now. So I'm going to just kick it over to you, uh, Father Salabe, but I guess the first question I would have for you is, what is the Optic Network, and what is your relationship with AI and ethics? Thank you very much, uh, Tyson. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to be here uh, with my terrible French accent. You can get where I come from, <laughs> unfortunately. So my English is not so good. But uh, actually, uh, Optic is a, a distributed international net network working on the impact of uh, disruptive technologies on the society and the human being. So we work uh, uh, on blockchain, we work on robots, we work on AI for sure. Uh, nanotechnology and so on. And we try to see how it can be beneficial for uh, the human being and for the society, uh, for the common good, or how it can be dangerous too. And, and so we do that by putting together on the same table people, people coming from the tech side, so private sector regulators, but also people coming from the humanities. And uh, let's say try to have a different conversation and try to map the land differently and to avoid blind spots. So actually, that's, that's our point of view. So I will not talk about uh, AI from the machine learning, purely tech uh, uh, point of view, even if many people can do that in Optic. But my point of view is more, let's say, from the humanities, from anthropology and sociology. So let's just start with those blind spots. Um, you know, there's been a lot more conversation this year than there were, say, two years ago about AI. And of course, one area we're seeing AI impact journalism and, and the information space already is in Facebook, Google, Amazon, et cetera, which are the largest investors in artificial intelligence uh, research. Um, what blind spots have there been and what, what kind of learning, what kind of evolution process have we seen take place in the ethics space here? I would say, generally speaking, the big problem is too often we zoom too much on the effect of the, what the, the technology we want to implement. And for example, in justice, we just see what is the direct impact if you replace a judge by an AI to know which convict can be paroled or not. Uh, but we don't see the more, the more general uh, impact on the society, uh, violence in jail, and so on. So just trying to see how things are distributed, for example, for this specific example about justice, you switch from a justice of causality to a justice of correlation. Uh, ju just to tell you uh, that in different words, let's say uh, that you're not judged because of what you do, but just because you're in the box of the Northern American 
people, male, uh, working in Germany and so on. And that changes a lot, uh, a lot of things, actually. And uh, speaking about inequalities, speaking about uh, biases, speaking about all those discrimination, sources of discrimination, a lot of them be, being unconscious, even for uh, the developers of those technologies, uh, it makes a lot of difference. So, so one example that Stuart Russell, who I know you've worked with, gives in this case, just talking about search engines, is if you Google the word CEO, you get a lot of white men. And that, of course, is an algorithmic reflection of biases that are present in the programmers. Um, and that can have an impact on public policy decisions when you're making public policy decisions, right? Yeah, exactly. The same if you Google professional haircuts, you will have only pictures of men. I don't know why, but... <laughs> That's the way it is, uh, and, and we see that there are the biases, let's say, that can, they can be in the algorithm, they can be in the data uh, with which uh, the algorithm is trained, and for example, we work a lot with the MIT, and there's a very brilliant uh, um, scholar there uh, uh, called uh, uh, Joy, and she discovered one day, she's African-American, and she discovered that uh, her phone did not unlock when she was just watching the, the, uh, the, the, the screen, just because she was too dark-faced. And for sure, it was not in t uh, the, the, the purpose or the intention of, uh, of the, the, phone can the phone maker. Uh, but it shows that just it was, the algorithm was only trail trained with uh, 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 Caucasian faces, mm -hmm. just because they had in mind that a human being is Caucasian. But you imagine, you put that in justice, you see the, the strong impact, the same in the healthcare system, for example. What does it mean to replace at least partly a physician by a, a robot or an algorithm or an AI? I mean, partly it can be very beneficial because you have a very good diagnosis. Uh, it can see things that the human eye cannot see. Uh, it can make decisions on uh, millions of cases. That's great. But at the same time, it changes the relationship you have with your physician. And this relationship, I mean, the physician is a little bit like a priest. You talk to a physician and it changes things. It cures already. I, even this conversation has, uh, uh, is part of the creation process or the transformation or the, the, the healing process more. And, and, and just uh, um, if you change that, you need to be sure that in this transformation process, what you get is better than what you lose. So just staying in the public policy space right now, I mean, you, what you've mentioned are a couple of areas where AI is starting to be integrated and it's bringing up real ethical questions, right? You've talked about insurance, insurance premiums, healthcare decisions. You talked about the criminal justice system, uh, college admissions in the United States. It's probably another example. So what kind of first principles should be brought into play to shape that kind of uh, decision-making uh, landscape? That's not an easy question because we're just mapping the land uh, uh, partly with the, the, the stakeholders and we discovered together uh, that uh, actually, yeah, that the, the criteria are not so easy to define. But I would say that things around transparency are key elements, uh, 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 accountancy and transparency. I would say they are the, the two key elements for the implementation of such a technology. But we see that unfortunately, according to the state of the art of the technology, uh, those, it's not so easy to avoid the black box effect. It could change this summer because I think there will be a couple of announcements by big companies, uh, let's say, uh, 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 about uh, machine learning, new processes that could allow to have a better vision of what's in the box. But up to now, it just gives you a, a decision. You have to take it for what it is. I mean, already we're seeing, obviously, Google released uh, a statement on its ethics uh, regarding AI. Uh, several companies have said that they are consulting. They have essentially boards, uh, uh, advisory boards of scholars, uh, multi-stakeholder uh, representatives <laughs> talking to them about AI, but we don't necessarily always know who those people are. We don't know what the processes are. So the black box isn't just technical. Sometimes it's also uh, people essentially, right? Yeah, but I think you cannot avoid that because a, a company uh, like a government cannot disclose any kind of information. So for sure, they will want to keep some things for themselves. What I would like to tell them, and when we work together, that's uh, the point I try to make, is um, let's say to switch from an ethics of uh, um, uh, uh, just checking the box. So if you do everything okay, let's say it's fine. Uh, and most of the time, it's an ethics of 
consequentialism. So it's just like, if the consequences are not bad, okay, let's do it. So there's no danger. But this kind of ethics, most of the time, is more risk management. So switching to an ethics which is more, let's say, based on a, a, a continental philosophy and which is more an ethics of principles. You don't do something just because you consider it's bad, mm -hmm. even if you don't go, uh, uh, get an outcome which is dangerous for your company or your state. Okay, so, I get, so we have three principles that I, I hear right now so far. We have the principle of transparency, we have the principle of accountability, and the way that we formulate principles generally, which is not necessarily the applied formation, rather it's, it's more uh, theoretical, that they're kind of categorical. Is that correct? Exactly. Okay. Um, so let's, let's move a little bit into the information space. So we talked a little bit about public policy decision making, but we know that the biggest companies working on this stuff are uh, ICT companies. And a lot of them have inf interest primarily in advertising, right? So why is advertising driving the AI revolution? I mean, up to now, I would say that data drives the AI revolution. But the problem is who has the big data? Only big companies. And those companies, most of them, have a business model which is, uh, let's say, uh, uh, advertisement driven. So let's say advertising is, is, is a key element. That's why uh, they try to gather all this, those information. But things could change if you can uh, use an, an algorithm which is uh, trained with less data. It means in such a case that scarcity is not on data, it could be on algorithm on, on something different. And that also could change very soon. But up to now, for sure, companies who do a lot of advertisement, they have a lot of data, and for sure, they, they are the best, in the best position to train an AI, I would say. Yeah, they're in the best position. A lot of times, as you know, we talk about AI, its applications in, in national security, in cybersecurity, in kinetic warfare. But the truth is that the defense sector is not the leading investor. It's these big, it's these big companies. But let me ask you uh, something. Let me ask you something. Because no, I, this brings up a, a... I will not go on that way. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Well, let me, let, me, let, me ask, let me press you here because there has been a lot of uh, talk right now about the relationship between these big platforms and the defense sector and uh, defense ministries. How do we shape that space ethically when they're using their AI? I would say that, uh, generally speaking, there's a kind of curve, there's a line of uh, evolution of innovation. Most of the time, it starts by uh, the healthcare system, medical purpose, because that's the best way to uh, have the approval of the public opinion. If you do something to help disabled people, everybody is okay. Then the next step is uh, a military use. No, let's be honest. But it's just because it's too strategic. Defense is too strategic for, for government. So that, that's why. And then once it's used, I would say, by defense and uh, our aerospace industry, then it comes back to something more commercial, I would say. But so yeah, the, starting with that first sector, because you know, one thing that we've talked about and I think a lot of people are interested in is we're pursuing AI. Are we... Are we doing the right thing in pursuing it at all? Are we, are we playing Icarus here? Are we flying a little too close to the sun? And people point to the healthcare sector. Uh, what do you think about AI usage in healthcare? Do you think it's a, a good, bad, indifferent? What do you think? I, it's difficult to, to give, a, 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 let's say, a, a, an answer to such a general question. I would say that, generally speaking, it's pretty good, uh, but it's not so powerful as many people think. And, and even generally speaking, AI is a, like a very small boy. It's not like a tall giant now. And everybody is just imagining something, having in mind something which is strong and powerful and uh, knows everything and so on. But we are so far from that. We need to, let's say, to, 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 to go back to reality. And reality is so far from Terminator on one side or iRobot on the other side. But isn't now the perfect time to talk about the ethical questions because there's no path dependency? I think that, that's the right time, and that's why some, uh, for example, the, the, the initiative of AI for Good in Geneva uh, last year and this year again, 
uh, involving the, the United Nations, uh, many agencies of the United Nations and uh, the private sector, uh, this kind of initiative is very good. And it, it shows that it's the right time and probably the private sector as uh, well as governments start to see that just to avoid rejection by uh, the public, they need to take care of that, of the values. So do you think, what do you think, I mean, you talk to a lot of people, a lot of different stakeholders, elites, but also, you know, all sorts of types of people. Uh, what do you think the public perception is of AI right now? I depends from one country to another, but I would say that uh, one half is Terminator, and, uh, and the other half is it will save the world. Uh, in between, there's just a few percent of people who consider that what it is really, it means a tool which is not neutral, pretty powerful, but remains really a tool. Mm -hmm. So we, we talked a little bit about the healthcare space. You said that then the, the natural extension is into defense because that's where governments go. They have a lot of resources at their disposal. That's kind of, you know, just they think strategically. AI is a strategic technology. What kind of ground rules should we start to set now to make sure that AI is used in the public good, also in national security? I think that's not so easy to do because uh, for sure uh, it's only restricting information. But I know, I know, let's say, uh, that uh, some governments and international institutions really take care about that and really work on, let's say, the impacts and the ethical impacts of, for example, autonomous weapons, because we see that we cannot ban them because this technology is too cheap and everybody, I would say, could buy and or, or build a, 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 um, an autonomous weapon. So even terrorists, every, any kind of groups and so on, so we cannot ban them. But the way they will be used, they will be involved on the battlefield, that has to be discussed. And, and I know that it is discussed. The same for the use of AI in the command chain. What happens uh, if you put some of AI, let's say, some decisions which are not human uh, in the command chain? Uh, what's the ethical impact? All of those questions are discussed. We, we know that. But for sure, they, they cannot be discussed publicly. So we have to accept. I know that it's not easy for journalists to know that not everything is public and not everything is accessible even with a, with, with a, a, a press pass. But uh, that, that's the way it is. But uh, you, you talked about the idea of not always talking about applied principles, that we should just have categorical principles. You know, somebody like Brad Smith from, um, from Microsoft talks about a Hippocratic oath uh, for AI. You know, first do no harm. That's where we have to start. Is something like that feasible and realistic? I think that probably very soon we will be able to teach not only, uh, let's say, basic notions or goals to AI, but also concepts and perhaps values. That could change the game completely. But up to now, it's not possible. So, for example, a self-driving car doesn't crash pedestrians just because in the program it says don't crash pedestrians. But there's no idea why. I mean, why is it bad to crash a pedestrian? There's no respect for life. There's no knowledge of what's human life. That could be perhaps teached in the next generations of uh, machine learning processes. In such a case, you can start to implement some, let's say some values in, in the, let's say, embed uh, ethical by design in the system. That could change things. And actually, we work on some, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, models allowing to, uh, let's say, train the AI in a way which would uh, uh, not allow uh, misuses of this AI. For example, if an AI is a bit empathetic and not only mimicking empathy, it cannot manipulate you because there's a, ki there's a kind of... Uh, reaction, retraction to it. Up to now, the, the, the AI is a cold intelligence. It's, it's just, it, yeah. it, 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 he, there's no, no feeling, there's, n there's no retraction. And so, uh, for sure, it can compare your, uh, let's say, uh, uh, your, your uh, behavior with many patterns and find the best way to have a conversation with you. I mean, I, one example I think you might be hinting at is Tay, which is, uh, seen so differently in different cultures. I mean, 
do you think when we let these kind of AI systems, like the chatbot Tay from Microsoft, uh, loose on different value systems in different societies, it provides different outcomes? Are we seeing that? We see that, unfortunately, that the, the human being is very often the actual, the actual eel of the, the, the machine. So very often, uh, it was a, a very good example. Uh, uh, the problem is not the machine by itself, but the human behavior that uh, the machine could copy. And, and very often, I, I would say, we would like to have a driverless cars, but we would, we would like them to drive better than we do. Uh, we, would, uh, we, we try to have uh, robot judges, uh, but we, we want them to be uh, purely objective, which is not possible. But we ask too much to technology on one side. And on the other side, if there's not an improvement, what's the point to replace a human being by a machine? Let's take the replace a human being by machine, and then we'll go a little bit into the journalist and fake news space. You know, one of the things that comes up a lot in the United States and Europe and others is the future of work. And are robots going to replace us? Is AI going to fuel our ultimate uh, uh, pink slip, you know, that we're let go from our companies, essentially? Um, and there's been a lot of emphasis in both the U.S. and Europe on STEM, science, technology, uh, engineering, and math. But you have people like um, Jack Ma saying, this is all just bridge technology. We're going to be replaced anyway by AI. So we need to focus on the humanities. That's where our value add is. Is that true? I think it's partly true because um, I would say, yeah, uh, two things are not easy to replace. It's creativity and human relationship. They are the two points. If in your job, if it's based on human relationship or on creativity, you have less risk to be replaced by a machine that if you do something, even uh, very smart, but which is more like uh, analytic or whatever. Uh, so I, I agree with that. The point is, for me, uh, uh, replacing a human being by a machine is not so disruptive. That's the first idea which comes, I mean, it, it, it came to, in mind to, to novelists perhaps one century ago. Uh, and I just, I try to take you, replace by a machine. Okay, it, I mean, there's no creativity in that. What happens if you try to use differently the AI? For example, you don't replace the, uh, the journalist by an AI to write uh, cheaper and faster articles for many writer, uh, readers. I mean, th that's, that's, the, that's the first idea that a lot of people have in mind is just cut costs, replace human beings. But what happens if you uh, use AI to empower people? That is really disruptive. So, for example, if you take the example of uh, judges and <coughs> the judicial system, instead of replacing judges, what happens if you uh, build and train an AI to help the prosecutor to ask the right questions? It's not part of the decision. It's just providing an help to be sure that there will be no blind spot in the, in the, in the, in the, in the case. If you do that, you add... A value you don't replace something by something else you add a value to the current system to my mind this is much better well, you're talking about sometimes rote decision making or things that are maybe a little bit repetitious or maybe monotonous even in journalism you know you see at the Washington Post for example uh, the deployment of heliograph which is now writing basic articles on sports on election results the kind of basic stuff in the legal field, you see a lot of work that used to be done by paralegals, uh, by notaries, being done by AI systems. But a question I would have for you, also it's just an ethical question, is, isn't that part of the educational ladder? Don't we all have to start at that basic rote level in order to get to that high performing uh, level? I would say that the, the interest of AI is that what can be easily replaced is that, we, which is, let's say, repetitive. But we see also that Unfortunately, in the way we do our job, there's too much repetition. And I think that very often we just abandon creativity and we just try to do always the same. I mean, what's the interest of an article which can be written by a machine? It can also be read by a machine. Okay. Mm -hmm. But that's not interesting for me. I'm sorry. But and so, I'm sorry to say that to journalists, but there are so many articles. They are always the same always the same way to phrase things and so on. 
I mean, it's so boring. I mean, for me, it reminds me that the planet of the, a the, uh, the apes. Uh, uh, in, in this novel, no, the problem is in this novel, at the end, you discover why uh, um, the humanity failed. And humanity failed because they abandoned their creativity. They started to do always the same. And, and I think that's the case in, in uh, information, which is becoming infotainment, but it's also the same in, in uh, uh, finance. It's the same in many ways. The human being is like a monkey. We do the, always the same. If you do the same, you can be replaced by a machine. Mm. We are going to open it up for questions, but I'm going to throw out one final question, and we'll see the audience who has questions here. Um, on the dark side of, of the journalism and AI space, which is, is fake news and, and falsified information. We see uh, we had a falsified Obama video, which is pretty realistic. It's pretty convincing. Uh, we had a, a demonstration of Google's assistant making telephone calls, uh, making bookings for haircut appointments and for restaurants, where it was able to fool the person on the other side of the line. And this technology is only going to get better. How do we imbue our information ecosystem with trust when we know things are going to be easier to fake in the future? I think that, yeah, trust is the, the key point. Uh, I mean, I used to think that we were in a post-truth society, so in a society where uh, there was a kind of crisis of truth. But I don't think so anymore. I think that uh, to pretend at least to speak the truth continues to be something which is anthropologically deeply rooted. But the point is just that we change the way we discern and see what's true and what's not. And it's more a crisis of authority and a crisis of trust. And the big problem is that many people don't trust anymore the mass media as they don't trust the politicians or they don't trust the system. We have a society in many countries in Europe, we can see that there's a kind of uh, growth of populism. And I would say that it's a kind of anti-system society, which is a bit kind of paradox, but that, that's the way it is. And, and I think that for sure, uh, currently, we have to rebuild trust. And one of the points for me, uh, at least uh, I would say for professional uh, uh, journalists or professional media, is just to identify very clearly what is done by a machine and what is not. And for example, a, 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 a voice assistant calling to a book for an haircut, it should officially say, I'm the, uh, the, I'm the, the, the digital assistant of Mr. So-and-so just because people have to know if they speak to a human being or to a machine. Otherwise, there's a kind of uncanny valley. You can have this strange, strange feeling. Mm -hmm. And after, after a time, you, you're never sure you talk to a human being. That's a real problem for me. Even in the relationship bet uh, between us, it will be a problem. Yeah, and it's just going to get uh, more uncanny and more realistic in the future. I, yeah, but it, it can fake my voice. And yeah. I could say, OK, uh, I have to, to call my mother, but pff, that's so boring. <laughs> so you have your AI self call your mother. Yeah, and, and so yeah, I call my mother and say that I'm, I'm fine. And, then, <laughs> and yeah, but that, that, that's humanly speaking, that's so poor. And that, that's also so uh, unethical. Sorry to we, say that. But we have a question here and, and then in the back. Uh, thank you, first of all, for your really comprehensive presentation. Uh, I'm from Georgia. I run the Gagra Institute, which is the first fully cloud-operated think tank. But I have uh, two questions. L like, first is about data-driven companies based on advertisement economy uh, are running digital services. Those are operating on dopamine cycles, exploiting the human psychology. <laughs> Do you think that data companies are, in general, centralized or decentralized? And do you think that data decentralization could happen by bringing a new encompassing platform uh, of all database ser services like a blockchain technology? Let's say if all the social networks would become accessible on one platform. Let's say there are lots of them, they are data driven and they have centralized ecosystems. And what if someone will invent something which will bring all of them in one network? This is my one question. And second is, what do you think about human e human AI robot relation while human is an aware of the phenomena of robot while AI robot has no awareness of human phenomena because it's not fully decoded by psychology or other in like uh, brain in brain sciences so what do you think what how could it uh, happen or like the 
what's say the linkage of these two phenomena while we are everywhere there for robot and technological progress why they are not aware of fully human phenomena thank you yeah just to start yeah two, two diff diff very difficult questions to to try to start by the the second one i i would say that we we just forget that uh, there, there's a big trap, which is reductionism. We consider that at the end of the day, we could put everything in zero and one. Everything could be computized, and so everything could be predicted, and so everything could be uh, matched with the AI. I think it's just not possible. And th there's probably we will go closer and closer and closer, that, but there's a remaining part. Uh, uh, this is uh, one of the big uh, works currently of uh, Joy Ito at the MIT Media Lab. Uh, uh, trying to fight against re reductionism, tr tr trying to say that the mind is not the brain, and the brain is not just f uh, uh, chemical and, and uh, electrical interactions. And so at the end of the day, you cannot explain everything and you cannot match perfectly. So, you, I mean, if we could create an AGI, so having a kind of self-awareness or conversation or whatever, we would have the same difficulty to interact that inter interacting with another species. And it's so difficult to understand each other just among the human species. It's, it, I mean, among humans, when I, what I say and what you uh, listen and what you understand is already very different. And it's not only because of our French accent, it's just because we are human beings. <laughs> and, and, and so I think that it will be the case, and that's, that's a kind of dream of the perfect machine able to connect on us and understand us perfectly. Thanks to God, I hope it will never happen. And so to go back to your first question, I would say that uh, what can uh, uh, change the deal, change the game, is disruptive technologies. Each time a new kind of technology will emerge, for example, for blockchain, up to now, the, let's say the Bitcoin blockchain, the current user of blockchain, is pretty limited. But if new protocols emerge, new uses, new stakeholders, and so on, for sure we can see, let's say, a redistribution of the game among the stakeholders. That will be the same for uh, uh, the data-driven industry. Up to now, is very concentrated, for sure. It could change, or we could have newcomers within two years, very, very easily. Just depends. If someone comes with a really disruptive technology, then he changes the game. Sorry, we're a bit far from journalism, but <laughs> tell me if it's boring. <laughs> um, hello, my name is Pauline. I'm from the United Nations System Staff College. And I have a question on, um, just a comment on what you just said about um, the journalists writing are so boring. And, um, what the, and to go back to the, quest, to the topic, would you rather have an AI change the paragraphs and the words based on your preferences, the way that you want it to be presented to you, the news and uh, articles that you read? And if so, is that the kind of society that we want to have? Because I see the value in having news presented in how they are presented right now. But then if it's curated, personalized, individualized with the words that these people like, and every one of us here would experience news in, di in different ways. And I, I can imagine that, again, going back to the topic, you would rather have maybe robots come to press conferences like this and um, con conferences because they can provide you with that kind of content. Yeah, so but personal experience. Yeah, but the, the, this personal experience is on one side very exciting, on the other side very dangerous. I, I mean, what's media? A media is something operating a mediation f between reality and your mind. And what's the quality of mediation? Up to now, uh, or I would say now, things are uh, instantaneous. It comes immediately. And so you can have the feeling that it's immediate. And so a lot of people don't see if the mediation is a high quality or low quality mediation. I mean, they don't see if there's a real work of professional ethical journalists or if it's just done by a machine or just by a blogger who has absolutely no clue of anything but just writes what he wants to write. And that's the danger. And I think to go back to your question, the big difficulty is that uh, um, a, a media is like a, a, an open door to the world. 
uh, what you say is what you describe is an article that will not refer to the reality but to my preferences so actually what i will see is my vision always reinforced of the reality and so for sure it will not help me to be uh, open-minded it will not help me to change my mind it w I w there will be no evolution i will be stuck somewhere and always be reinforced in that way being in a kind of bubble that's, ter that's terrible. So if you were on an editorial board or you were advising an editorial board that was trying to avoid this kind of situation where you're giving reinforcing information to individuals where they just get what they want to read, well, how would you deal with that? With I think the, the point is to be able to, uh, let's say, uh, um, give to people what they need to have. And so, for example, someone, a friend of mine, uh, he's a startup in the Silicon Valley, and he's, he has trained his own uh, AI for uh, content curation, so reading thousands of articles and just picking some of them. And the machine gives to read to him uh, uh, articles on the topics he's interested in. Otherwise, there's no interest of just selecting. You can do that at random, I would say but at the same time trying to keep an open door to other topics or related topics and that's interesting because it keeps him open to other things and so he can have also i don't know currently he's a, he's a democrat but time to time he has uh, articles uh, um, which really are referring to a republican point of view and that's interesting for him just to have another point of view Hello, my name is Isabella Kurkowski. I'm the Deutsche Welle country representative, uh, Deutsche Welle Academy country representative in Myanmar. Um, it is such an interesting discussion, honestly. But um, one thing that is always involved in all of this is simply someone who sends the message and someone who gets the message. And then it is an interpretation again. So I would like to pose the question a little bit of the ethics that you touched upon on about the media self-regulation. If you have a created news, for example, yes, it might be a nice text produced, sent out to the world, but who will guarantee that the picture probably goes along, provides a different message, and is perceived in a different culture, in a different, probably, uh, cultural environment in a different uh, way than for another culture. So it's a highly ethical question. And another point is, what will happen if, for example, such a mes message that was spread out has to be corrected or should be corrected or where to complain, how to deal with this? So this would be something I would be very much interested in. Thank you very much. Uh I think that, yeah, for technology, the big problem is the one billion users product. So uh, a technology I I is only profitable if you can spread it massively. And so it has to be the same for everybody. And the big problem is to deal with that. But you, thanks to God, this uh, difference of interpretation will remain. Just see the picture of uh, Angela Merkel and, and the, the, the G7 people talking to, uh, uh, talking to Donald Trump. Uh, there are clearly two very different interpretations. It seems that in the United States, they are very satisfied showing, seeing that he's sitting, which is the position of authority, and all of them are standing, which is not a position of authority. But here in Germany, people say, no, but she's uh, having a look over him, and so she's having the authority. Yeah, you see that actually this picture seems to satisfy everybody, but not for the same reasons. That's, that's the problem. <laughs> And what about the question of, you know, uh, dealing with correctives? How do, you, how do you bring in correctives into the system? I think it's, it's not so easy to, I mean, uh, it's not so easy to correct that. I, I would say that the, the, the big problem is that uh, if you correct a bias, most of the time you introduce another one. And so it's like patching a system. The only way is to try, but up to now it's not exactly possible, to train, uh, let's say, more in depth the AI to build something which will be more in accordance with values 
so more with concepts than uh, building something which just gathers information otherwise for sure uh, i mean it can be it can be perfectly written but with a lack of common sense just i don't know if you got this information uh, um, this week uh, 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 a student uh, in the united states uh, gave a, a presentation in his university about uh, wakanda so Wakanda, I don't know if you know that, this is the, the, the country of uh, uh, Black Panther. So it doesn't exist. But the presentation was very well done about economy of Wakanda. And everybody in the university said, wow, oh, that's really interesting. And I didn't know this, this country, <laughs> by the way. For sure it doesn't exist. And, and you see that time to time, if, if things are formally well done, people don't care about what's underlying uh, about the facts and and I think that's a big problem uh, I think we have time for one more question if we have one if not I have one more question all right then I will ask my question which just links to this um, one of the things clearly you can use AI to do is create uh, distorted perceptions I mean you can deploy AI a company country uh, power with great resources can deploy AI to create the perception, for example, that an article goes viral or that a point of view is being chatted about or talked about online. Um, and creating these artificial perceptions, these artificial realities, is something that we're going to have to deal with more and more. How do we counterbalance that? Yeah, another difficult question. I would say that uh, th this, uh, this phenomenon is just the continuation of a trend is marketing. I mean, uh, from the very beginning, uh, influencing, having an influence on people is just, what, what's about politics and what's about marketing? It's about having an influence on people. Uh, but now we can do that or it can be done in a way which, will, which is completely new and, and, and massively. I think the only way to do that, uh, to, to counterbalance, is to have a very high quality professional uh, 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 information system. And uh, it means that, uh, I mean, I think we're in a time when it's more difficult to be journalist than ever, but that's the time when we need people able to guarantee an information and to give a vision which is, let's say, as uh, uh, free of distortion as possible. And that's the only way to try to counterbalance. And what I hope is that some people will discover at the end that uh, the social networks are not designed to inform yourself. They are designed to share information, create a community, and, and so on. But we use, it's already a misuse to, to use uh, uh, Facebook to get information. I mean, uh, just even professional content that will be uh, carefully selected by the algorithm in a way which will always reinforce the same tendencies, it's already a bad way to use Facebook. I mean, getting in touch with your friends or keeping in touch with your friends, that's the right way to use Facebook. I mean, this is the point. I think you raised the best point of all at the end. Uh, the best digital education is a humanist education, that we need to be critical thinkers, that we need to be able to engage critically with information with, with this wall of information that we're getting that can sometimes be falsified. And that will be the best antidote to uh, difficult, let's say, AI-driven uh, realities that we see. Thank you so much, uh, Father Salabay, and thank you guys, and hope to continue this conversation out there. Thank you very much.